All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Dazzling Dragonflies with the Mass Audubon. Whether you admire their stunning colors, incredible flying skills, or ability to control mosquitoes, dragonflies are worth a closer look. Known for their quick darting flight patterns, we'll explore how to best observe these amazing insects in nature. Learn about their unique behaviors and life history, how to identify commonly found New England species, and why wetlands and clean water are so important for these beautiful creatures. And today's program is led by Martha Gotch, who, uh, PhD, who is a conservation coordinator at Mass Audubon's Broad Meadow Brook Wildlife Sanctuary and Conservation Center. Again, wanna thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring. So all uh, nearly 90 of us or so who are watching live and the many more that will watch the recording, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Martha for, for spending her lunchtime hour with us and uh, Martha, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. You have incredible energy and I really appreciate that. Thank you for the great welcome. So good afternoon, folks. My name is Martha Gatch and I am coming to you from central Massachusetts. And I will let you know how much I appreciate and admire and just have a joy in holding dragonflies close to my heart and let you know that when I work with summer camp, my camp name is Dragonfly. So I really admire these creatures and I, it just gives me great joy to be able to spend the next hour or so with you talking about them. So we're gonna try and do everything that Robert said and maybe a little bit more today. And we are going to go through just exactly what a dragonfly and damselfly is and a little bit of the history of these creatures. They've been around for a long time with us. The anatomy of dragonflies to give you a basic um, roadmap to the creature so that you can then better appreciate what you're seeing and what they are doing. We're going to just briefly touch on dragonflies in some of our various cultures because they have been around for a long time and people have had a chance to really think about them and incorporate them into their into their lives. And then we'll get into some of the basic biology, reproduction and life cycles. How do you tell damselflies and dragonflies apart? What is unique about them? We'll go through some of the common groups and species of dragonflies. For those of you out in Maryland, it is amazing that you are joining us. I will say that um, we're gonna focus mostly on New England creatures. You will be able to take away some major points that will help you with uh, those that are close to your own homes. And then the ecology and the conservation of these important creatures, because as Robert uh, intimated, they are really important natural pest control. And if nothing else, we can appreciate them for that. So let's go. What is a dragonfly? Dragonflies belong to a group of insects um, called odonates. And odonates in general have very long slender bodies, elongated bodies. They have four wings. They come in two pairs. The wings are clear. They're not covered with scales as butterflies and moths have. And then they are very visually um, oriented. They have very, very large compound eyes. And those eyes make up one of the most striking features of this creature's body. Their larvae are aquatic. The adults live on land in air, but the larvae, they spend their first parts of their first part of their life in the water. So these creatures really bridge two very different environments and ecosystems. Etymology is a, is a, a very fun thing. And so I look to like to look at the origins of words. Odinate comes from the Greek odonto, which refers to tooth which gives you a hint that maybe these, these creatures are predators, that they're eating things out there. The damselflies, the group that is called damselflies, and we'll dive into that a little bit. Odinates are damselflies and dragonflies. Damselflies are zygoptera, which translates into even wings or wings that are pretty much identical. Dragonflies are anisoptera, 
which translates into unequal wings. And you can see a little bit of the difference in wing shape between the fore wings and the hind limbs, hind wings. The hind wings are, are generally smaller stocked and then expand out. The, the size of these wings and the way the muscles are attached to them means that these insects have incredible flight ability. And indeed they can fly much like helicopters. They can go up and down, forwards and backwards. They can go sideways, they can go um, at, at angles. And so one of the things you can do is to admire them in flight and just marvel at all the different things they can do. Odinace, as I've said, have been with us for a long, long time, 300 million years at least. That's the age of the fossils that we found. They are very, very good flyers. In addition to being acrobatic, they can also fly over 45 miles an hour. So don't get into a road race, a drag race with the dragonfly. They have variable lifespans depending on the species and where they are at in the world. They can live as short as six months to as long as five years. And with those large eyes, they are very much um, oriented by, by sight, by vision. And they are predatory. They will eat flying insects, non-flying insects. The aquatic nymphs will even eat small fish and tadpoles. I'll just let you know that the um, Robert mentioned that dragonflies is a little, um, I'm trying to find a good word. I'm just going to say intimidated, and I don't mean that in a bad sense at all. But because these insects are so large, they are definitely noticeable. I just want to let you know that the ancient ones had wingspans of almost three feet, which was possible. The whole thing was big, but possible because the oxygen levels in those days, 300 million years ago, were a lot higher than they were now. So they supported the additional respiration that allowed these insects to be gigantic. There are a lot of different odonates, a lot of different damselflies and dragonflies in the world, 2,500 species worldwide. In New England, we have almost 175 species. There are three families uh, in the damselfly a suborder, and then seven families in the dragonfly suborder. And a little bit later on, I will take you on a very brief tour through some of that diversity. But you can perhaps see in this picture that there is a little bit of difference. These pictures are not to scale, but a little bit of difference between the dragonflies and the damselflies. The dragonflies on the right tend to be stouter bodied. Let me get my cursor over here. Here we go. Stouter bodied and very large eyes and large neck. On the left, we have a representative damselfly. This is a much more fragile creature. It's much thinner. These tend to be weaker flyers hanging out in grasses and weeds and not going really high up in the air. Um, so if you're looking for damselflies, look down low, poke around in the grasses and near the pond shore. If you're looking for dragonflies, you can go out into the fields, you can look up, you can look down, they'll be flying among the trees. And that's one difference between the two, the two groups. Okay, so here's the overall morphology of dragonflies. And I debated whether to give you this schematic drawing or something that was a, a photograph. And I appreciate the schemas because it's much easier to see particular features. So we will have the, the photographs throughout the rest of the talk. So we do have, let me get my cursor over here, three body parts. Any insect has three body parts. There is the head, the thorax, and then the abdomen. Don't worry about the petiole, that little waist-like thing. That, that belongs, and it could go either with the thorax or the abdomen, however you want it. But the abdomen seem, is, is typically much longer, and it is segmented. The anal appendages at the end play a role in mating and reproduction. 
um, and we will talk about those later on. You can see how large the eyes are, and they're composed of two kinds of eyes. There's a very large compound eye, I'll show you that next, and then smaller, um, simple eyes towards the front of the head. The jaw is also, where my cursor go? Here we go. The jaws are also very, very large and occupied with the business of catching and, and eating. The legs help it to catch prey and also to perch, to hold on. And you'll see that they have claws um, on the edges of them. Here's my cursor again. Little claw-like extensions on the edges of the, of the legs that help hold the prey that they catch. And here's a, here's a photo, close up of the head of a dragonfly. And again, you can see how large the eyes are and they are composed of multiple thousands of facets that are each called an omatidium, plural omatidia. The larger ones are on the top of the eye and you can see maybe perhaps a slight difference between the top and the bottom of the eye. Larger omatidia on the top, smaller ones on the bottom. Around the antenna, and dragonflies have very short antenna, there are three sets of simple eyes which will see shadows, light and dark. And then the omatidia, the compound eyes, will give them up to 30,000 different images that their brain gets to knit together into a single image. It helps them find, find food, find prey. It helps them hunt. It also uh, helps them escape capture, perhaps from a bird that would like to very much have a nice juicy dragonfly. These eyes are the biggest compound eyes in any insects, including bees. When we're looking at different species of dragonflies and damselflies, one of the things we look at is the placement of the eyes relative to each other and relative to the head. And in some cases, the eyes will be knit together in a seam. The bottom left picture shows them together almost like a motorcycle helmet. And then you can see on the bottom right, they are, they meet in the middle, but they only touch slightly. In the top right, we're going counterclockwise. In the top right, they are actually separated a little bit, but again, they take up the majority of the head. And then at the top left, they are fully on the side, much like uh, a hammerhead shark. I like to think of these things as the, the sharks of the air. So we look at the relative size and the relative placement of the eyes and whether they are, are touching in the middle to look at the diversity. Up close, here's another picture of one of the characteristics that we look at to help us figure out what species we're looking at. And in many of the dragonflies, actually in everything, dragonflies and damselflies, there will be color patterns that you look for. Coloration, pigment, and placement of that pigment coloration uh, patterns. So in this darner dragonfly, and darners are some of our larger dragonflies, and they are incredible predators and very, very difficult to catch. They're really good flyers. You almost need to have them in the hand to be holding them or looking up close at them in order to identify them to species. Many of them will have patterns on their thorax. And here we're looking at the color, which is this lime green. And we're also looking at details of the patterning. So in the second segment, you'll notice that there's an extended portion at the top of the, of the insect. And that's called a flag, or I call it a flag. And that helps us understand that this is a kind of darner called a lance-tipped darner. It's one of the 12 species of the genus um, Eshna. Um, so there we are, we're looking at coloration, we're looking at, at patternings, and it often helps to have these animals in hand in order to identify them. One of the other interesting things you might notice is the wing coloration. And 
on dragonfly and damselfly wings, two things to note. In the forewing at the top, there is an inflection point, and that's called the node or the notice. That will not help you with identification, but it will help you understand the amazing flight ability that these animals have. Also of note is a darker area at the top called the pterostigma, pterostigma. That little piece of wing is just a little bit harder than the rest of the wing. And what that does with its physics of just being that little bit stiffer structure is that it damps down flutter in the wings because the wings are going so fast that they, if they didn't have something to damp down the, the excessive vibrations, um, it, would, it would destroy the wing and it would, it would dampen the ability of the, of the organism to fly. And there's the picture that, that illustrates it. This is a green darter, Carmen green darter, which is one of our common and largest dragonflies. And you should be able to see them flying out now. Dragonflies are seasonal. There are early summer and late summer varieties. And this one comes out in about midsummer and continues until, until autumn. And you get a sense of how quickly the wings are flying and are, are moving. And also that the back wings can operate independently of the front wings. And that's what gives these animals their ability to turn, to move up and down, forwards and backwards and sideways and, and all of those things. There are many, many different myths and pieces of folklore that apply to dragonflies because They've been with us as long as humans have been on Earth as well. And so each culture, and because they're, they're so evident and easy to see, each culture seems to have its own take on dragonflies. And we'll just briefly go through, um, through a couple of these. In China and in Japan, there, there are some interesting beliefs. So Japan is sometimes called the island of the dragonfly because to some people it looks a little bit like a dragonfly. You can see perhaps the head up here and then the body and the and the tail. And the dragonflies are beloved in Japan. They're thought to bring good fortune. It often appears in haiku poetry representing strength and happiness. And the red dragonfly, and there's a North American species illustrated here, the red dragonfly is considered sacred. In Japanese Buddhist tradition, the festival of Bon, which happens about this time of year, mid-August, so this is really um, temporally appropriate, is when the spirits return to visit the living. And some people believe, well, at, at about the same time, thousands of dragonflies up here in Japan. And some people believe that the ancestral spirits ride the dragonfly, while others believe that the spirits are actually part or within the dragonflies, that the dragonflies are carrying the souls of the, of the departed. And so for that reason, dragonflies are considered sacred. Any other time of year, Children are encouraged to play with dragonflies and to catch dragonflies, except for this time period, because the dragonflies are tied to the, the souls that are returning. And dragonflies are welcomed inside the house because of that. In China, dragonflies are also part of culture, and they represent harmony and good luck and prosperity, perhaps relating to the belief that dragonfly Dragonflies are the souls of dragons. There's also another fun Japanese um, story that the 21st emperor who was out hunting was bitten by another insect, perhaps a fly, perhaps a mosquito, but a dragonfly came along and ate that insect, captured and ate it, thus saving the emperor. And so for that reason, also dragonflies are revered. In North America, 
We often refer to dragonflies as mosquito hawks. Native Americans, some of them believe that dragonflies were originally dragons, note the link to China. And a coyote tricked a dragon into shape-shifting and it couldn't change back. And as a result, the dragonfly symbolizes change and speed and illusion. So held in high esteem, much like the coyote. Dragonflies also appear in Navajo sand paintings, Navajo necklaces, and Zuni pottery, which is illustrated here. And if Native American images show them near water, they represent the purity of the water. Dragonflies need clean water. European associations, so when, when Europeans um, came over to live in North America, they also brought common folklore associations. So in some cases, dragonflies are thought to predict the weather. If they're flying high, it means there'll be a heavy rain. If it, they're flying low, it means there will be a light rain or mist. If you're fishing and a dragonfly lands on your fishing rod, it means you're gonna have good luck. And supposedly the color of the dragonfly will predict the, the color of the fish that you're going to be catching. Some people, um, and take this, take this as you will, uh, some people have believed that dragonflies might sew together your fingers or your toes if you happen to fall asleep outdoors. The, I think the darners are who are that are also, which is a family of dragonflies, the common green donner, um, are also called sewing needles for that reason. And another belief refers to, or another saying, refers to dragonflies um, possibly sewing up the mouth of scolding women. Again, take that as you will. So going into the biology of these, of these really cool critters, um, dragonflies, as I mentioned before, are have an aquatic early part of their life cycle and then a terrestrial part of their life cycle. And this one, this cycle will show you the eggs to the nymph. There's a very, very brief period of time when the nymph metamorphoses into the adult. The adult is at a very fragile stage. I'll show you a picture of that. And then we have the, uh, the adult stage. Um, and my question to you is to just think in your head. And if you would like to put this in the chat, you may, or if you'd like to just think it to yourself, which life stage lasts the longest? Remember these, these creatures can live for six months to five years. Which life stage does it spend the majority of its time in? Okay, holding that thought, I will just simply tell you, because I don't have fancy graphics, that it's the nymph stage. So they spend the largest part of their life cycle as aquatic organisms in the water. The adults typically will live for uh, perhaps a few, a, a six weeks to a few months and some of our migratory species, the adults will last a little bit longer than that, but it is primarily the nymph stage. Let's start at the very beginning. Here is an amazing picture of dragonfly eggs and a nymph emerging, hatching from those dragonfly eggs. This means that the adult needs to lay its eggs in the water. So it has to, wherever it's been hunting, fields or forests, it needs to return to the water to lay eggs. And we'll get into that, that oviposition process in a, in a few slides. So here's what the nymphs look like. They either burrow, burrow into the sand to be sit and wait predators, or they are they have the ability to swim through the water, but often they will be in among the vegetation, the plants in the pond or the lake or the stream, climbing around looking for things to eat. I've pictured dragonfly nymph in the middle, and you can see like the adult, it's fairly robust. It has no external gills. 
It skills, it filters oxygen inside internally in the abdomen. And if it needs to move, it will jet propel water out of its backside and dart forward. Damselfly nymphs don't have that jet propulsion um, ability. They don't have that superpower. But they are, again, much like the adults, fairly thin-bodied, fragile, weak. They tend to swim through, you can't see my hand. You, they tend to swim through the water like a fish um, by wiggling, wiggling their body. But they will also hang out on stems and leaves of aquatic plants, actively hunting. And just to bring it home, that these are predators, these are hunters, they have amazing mouth parts. They have claws on the end of their, their jaws are external, and the claws at the end to grab prey, and to hold prey, but they also have a much greater part of their jaw, which they keep folded underneath of them and is hinged in the middle and can shoot out instantaneously to grab a tadpole that's swimming by or a small fish that's, that's swimming by. These are truly the things of nightmares. Uh, they are also... They're also the things that have, have given inspiration to, um, to movie makers and creative artists. If you go and watch some of the, the Star Wars movies, the masks, Kylo Ren, his mask is very definitely taken from the, uh, the mandible of a dragonfly nymph. So those are the nymphs. They are predatory, and I'm going to use I, I'm using nymph and larva interchangeably here. So don't worry about the don't worry about the name. When they have gone through four or five molts as a larva, and like any insect, their outer skeleton is very hard, and they have to replace it with a new one every time they grow out of it. They do that four or five times, and then the final one. They, it turns from a nymph into an adult. In order to do this, the animal, remember, is going from being a, an aquatic organism, taking its oxygen from the water, to an organism that breathes air. And so it's the whole respiratory system has to change and be renewed. They have full-fledged wings. They've only had wing buds um, that have been developing as, an, as a nymph. Their legs are a little bit different. The mouth parts are different. It's just the whole, it's, it's amazing. Metamorphosis is absolutely incredibly amazing. This stage of emergence, the animal is called a tenoral. It's very weak. Its outer skeleton is not hard. Its wings have to be pumped up like a butterfly's wings, they have to harden before it flies, and it's very vulnerable at this stage. So these animals crawl up generally at dusk up the side of a nearby plant, a cattail stem or what have you, and or a rock, and they pump their bodies so that a lot of fluid is in their shoulder area that splits the skin and then the adult shaped insect inside emerges. The little white tubes, let me get my cursor back, the little white tubes that you see are the breathing tubes turned inside out. The animal literally crawls out of its skin and as it does so it has to shed the line of those breathing tubes, those are left behind. The adult has an entirely new respiratory system. After the, the body hardens and the wings harden, the animal will leave the pond or the stream and it will go to a nearby field. And it will it, it takes a few weeks in that field to develop its color and to hunt to feed, to get its reproductive system ready to mate. So that's why we see 
dragonflies and to some extent damselflies in meadows where there's no water nearby because they are at a different part of their of their life cycle. Um, they will return to the water when they are ready to mate. And let's talk a little bit about that, that mating process. If you see two animals hooked together, either in this heart shape or wheel shaped, that's called a mating wheel. One of these is a male and one is a female and they are transferring sperm to the female in order to fertilize the eggs. Let me break that down for you. The male is the blue one. The female is the lighter blue, or perhaps it's green on your screen. The male, the female has only a single part of her body that is devoted to mating. Her genitalia, her, her, the place where her eggs are stored and will be laid is at the end of her abdomen right here. The male has two body parts that are very important to mating. The sperm exits at the end of his abdomen, but before he finds a female, he transfers those, the sperm, to the top of his abdomen, segments two and three here. Some places will refer to that as his penis. It's not really, but that's how it how it acts. And the female needs to bring her, the end of her abdomen where her eggs are, getting my cursor back, up close to the top of his abdomen and hold there for a number of hours in order to transfer sperm. That's what's happening with the mating wheel or this heart-shaped um, connection of the two creatures that you see. They will stay hooked together for a few hours and when that sperm transfer has been complete, the male in many cases will hang on to her. He has special organs at the end of his abdomen, at his tail end, that clasp her behind the neck and he is guarding her from mating with any other male. She will go around and oviposit, lay her eggs. And she, so she's doing that. She's the one with her abdomen in the water on top of this plant. She is slicing over that plant and laying, making a little slice into it and laying an egg in each, each slice. So that way the eggs are protected. So you probably won't see this if you go out to the pond, but if you watch dragonflies and you see them doing that slicing behavior or just hanging on, perhaps you can go looking closer for, for those eggs. Here are common green darters, uh, darners male and female uh, overpositing on dead cattail leaves. This is one reason why you don't, why it's why, Vegetation and dead things in ponds are actually valuable. They're habitat for dragonflies. Here are dragonflies that are tapping the surface of the water. Sometimes they mistake the tops of our shiny cars for that. And so if you see a, a dragonfly try, touching its abdomen to your car, it may be trying to lay eggs. And sometimes, um, as in the, the, the uh, meadow hawks here, they're ovipositing in, in the mud. All right, let's go. This is gonna be a whirlwind tour through, through dragonflies and damselflies. And again, as I said, we have about 175 species in New England, three families of damselflies, seven fly, uh, families of dragonflies. The difference between them, again, is that the dragonflies are stout and large, large bodied. They have rounded heads. Damselflies are delicate, small bodies, narrow abdomens, their heads tend to be wider, they're narrower, so wider than long. Damselfly eyes are far apart. Dragonfly eyes cover much of the top and sides of the head. The wings have slightly different shapes. The big thing when you're seeing these animals at rest is that dragonflies will hold their wings out straight, spread horizontally. Damselflies will tend to hold them folded over their backs or slightly parted. Dragonflies are strong flyers, damselflies are weak flyers. So again, 
to yourself or in the chat, going over what we, what we cementing what we just covered. Would this be a dragonfly or a damselfly? What's your best guess? You have to 50-50 chance. Okay, let's see. They're still coming in. This is great. Slowing down. This is awesome. Thank you guys for playing. Are you right? It's a damselfly. It's one of our bluet damselflies. Our pond damsels are 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 um, have many blue and black damselflies. How about this one? Big wings, a little bit different shapes, strong body. In the interest of time, we're just going to go ahead. This one is a dragonfly. This one's called a Halloween pennant. Halloween because of the colors. It's You should see them flying now. And then here's the third one. Wings are slightly spread. Eyes are set apart. The head is narrow, the body is narrow. And so that makes this one a damselfly. And this is one of my favorites, the ebony jewel wing, which is, we're a little bit past their season now, but you'll often see them in shaded streams in the forest. And they have these amazing black wings and iridescent bodies. When you're looking at dragonflies and damselflies, pay attention to the color patterns on the insects, the shape of the body, where you're seeing them. Some are only in rivers and streams. Some are in still water. And when you're seeing them, is it early in the spring? Is it late uh, in the season, you know, round about now? And then what are they doing? How, how are they flying? Are they strong or weak flyers? Are they hunting? Uh, are they ovipositing? And how are they perching? Just to show you some of the difference in colors, we can get color differences even between some of the species in males and females. Here's our spangled skimmers. Spangled skimmers have these white patches, white pterostigmas on their wings. Males are blue, females are brown and, and yellow. Perching behaviors can be horizontal. Uh, this autumn meadow hawk, hawk is perching on a poison ivy leaf and it's holding its body straight. Our eastern amber wing is perching at a 45 degree angle, and our blue dasher is perching straight up and down vertically. So we'll just go through these fairly briefly. Three families of damselflies um, are broad wings, as illustrated by our ebony jewel wing, and the male is the all black wing, and the female has the white dot at the end of her wing. There are a lot of a lot of species, nine in North America. Our spread wings are very long damselflies and tend to hold their wings partly open. And we have nine of these in Massachusetts. They're all in the genus um, Lestes. And these you'll start seeing in mid-June is when the nymphs emerge and hatch into adults and until late August. So we have another week or so to enjoy these. And then our pond damsels, which is a huge, huge family. 96 uh, genera, or sorry, 96 species, 13 genera in North America, seven genera, 35 different species in Massachusetts. It's often enough to just say this is a pond damsel and leave it at that. All different kinds of wetland habitats. We find these on the coast. We find these in inland and... We have the blue and black ones. We have purple but black, purple ones, variable dancers, and, and a few variable dancers. And um, shoot, I'm going to blank on the other one that's also purple. And then green bodied ones, but notice it still has a little bit of blue on the end. This is an Eastern fork tail. And then getting into our dragonflies, seven families here with it just fun names. We have our spike tail dragonflies, which have these odd eyes that just touch in the middle of their head. 
About three inches in adults, their eyes are bright blue or bluish green. And the eyes do not touch in the middle. They just come to a point. You'll find these near streams and seepy areas of wetlands. Our darners are the most robust bodied of our dragonflies. The common green darner is perhaps our largest one. Uh, it's at least three inches long, three and a half inches. Really strong flyers. If you're trying to chase them with a net, you get one chance. Otherwise, they're gone, never coming back. Their large eyes meet in the seam on the head, so um, they will touch over a broad distance. Identifying these, you want to look at the color patterns of the thorax, so the shoulder area. You'll often see these patrolling, and that means they're flying up and down, forward and back. These guys are defending a territory because it perhaps has good um, habitat for laying eggs, and they also are defending it against other males for females that would come in so that they can mate with them. The next one is also a darner, and that just shows you some of the color variation. This one is called the comet darner. And then this one is hard to see, but if you see a large dragonfly flying towards the end of the day and all you can see are two bright yellow spots, you probably have a fawn darner. Our next family is called the club tail. I put the this picture of a cobra club tail just because what a cool bug, right? Bright green eyes. Um, many of the club tails have this widened abdomen at the end, and this one does look like a little bit like a, a cobra that's spreading its head. We only have, well, we not only, we have 27 different species of club tails in Massachusetts. These are mostly found in river habitats or near river habitats. So they like um, flowing water, broad, um, a broad aquatic habitat that gives you a choice of, of depths. And when you have flowing habitat, you often have high levels of oxygenation. So uh, that's what these animals require. You will not see any red or blue colors in club tails. And here's a picture of, uh, what a cool name, right? Dragon hunter. This animal eats other dragonflies. It flies up high. It's out in the evening. So this is something that you'll see flying around the tops of the trees. This slide also shows you how to hold a dragonfly. It is, where the, because the dragonflies have fairly sturdy bodies, it is possible to enjoy these up close, to catch them. And when you want to hold them, you want to pin the two wings together over the top of the back. You want to hold them with the side of the fingers so that you avoid getting um, uh, oils, body oils on them that would harm their wings. And if you hold them by the wings, it will keep the wings, keep the animal from damaging its wings because it's not flailing around. Our next group of dragonflies are the emeralds because they often have beautiful emerald eyes. 22 species in Massachusetts. These are small to medium to large sized dragonflies. They're often brown or black. They, if they have markings, they'll be pale yellow. They'll mostly be on the abdomen, hardly anything on the thorax. And it's often hard to, uh, to get the identification of this down to the species level. They are in a wide variety of habitats. You'll find them in bogs, you'll find them in fens, you'll find them in little ponds and big lakes and rivers and streams. Each species has its own habitat. The skimmer family also has a large number of species. And some of these exhibit what's called pruinosity, which is this white waxy coating that shows up primarily on the males and on the abdomen. This is something that develops over time. So while the animals are maturing and getting ready to mate, they might start out without, you'll be able to see the colors on the abdomen, but over time the pruinosity grows and covers up those colors. 
This one is called the common whitetail. It is one of the most common dragonflies you will see. This is a male showing its pruinosity. That's a female. Notice that there are different wing patterns. The male has large patches of black on the wing and nothing, no pigmentation on the very end of the wing, clear wings at the end. The female has pigmentation on the end of the wing and then two additional patches. And she also has this brown abdomen with some pale yellow markings along the side. Again, these animals frequent um, bogs, ponds, lakes, and streams, so a variety of habitat. You'll often see the adults in the field, in meadows, and some of these are migratory. We're just starting to understand migration patterns and abilities of dragonflies. We're pretty sure that our big common green darters are migratory, going up and down the east coast. We believe that some of these skimmers are migratory, but we don't know where they go yet or how long they live. Lots to be learned. We'll just go through very quickly some of the diversity of our skimmers because they're gorgeous. Here we have male on the left, female on the right, spangled skimmers. Remember that the, the spangles are the white patches on the tip of the wing. Here is a calico pennant, which is also a skimmer. There is the male, what a beautiful creature. Lots of wing markings. And here is a male blue dasher which is also a skimmer, bright green eyes, bluish semi pruinos body. Again, a very common creature that you might be seeing. Calling out one of the amazing phenomena of dragonflies is this particular species called the wandering glider, which is found worldwide. They found it at in the Himalayan mountains, 6,200 meters, that's at what, about 18,000 feet. It was the very first insect to come back after the nuclear testing uh, in the Bikini Atoll. It's also the only dragonfly to be found on Easter Island. These form migratory swarms of dragonflies, not so much in North America. There aren't too many of them in, in North America, but we've known about this creature um, since the late 1700s. It was described in 1798. It is considered to be the most widespread dragonfly on the planet. And we know that individuals can, in their lifespan, travel 3,700 miles. In a year, um, a, an individual or groups of dragonflies can travel up to 11,000 miles. Just absolutely incredible to think about how these creatures get around. And then we're going to finish up with um, with some of our uh, some of our, our skimmers here. The eastern amberwing is one. It's a tiny little thing. It's about an inch to an inch and a half long, and it is going to be commonly found on ponds this time of year. So if you see a tiny little yellow dragonfly with variable markings on its wings, um, that's going to be an eastern amberwing. And then another one that you're going to see is the meadow hawks. And there are a couple of different varieties of meadow hawks. Two of them are absolutely indistinguishable if you don't have a microscope. And so those are, of course, the two that I put, chose to put up. The ruby meadow hawk or the cherry-faced meadow hawk, the male is this bright red with a red face, and then the female is, uh, is more brown. You might also see autumn meadow hawks this, this time of year. And then we'll just finish up with a few notes about ecology and conservation of these creatures. Here is a damselfly in action. It's caught uh, a little mayfly or perhaps a stonefly because it's got two abdominal appendages. These are predators, no matter how small, no matter how large. They are very, very helpful in taking out our, in keeping our mosquito populations, our fly populations, et cetera, tamped down. They are part of our natural pest control. And because they cover such a wide variety of habitats. The, the young forms, the uh, nymphs are, and eggs are aquatic. The adults are terrestrial. We need clean water and clean air to support these creatures. We need healthy insect populations to support these creatures. Uh, they, are, they are bio indicators of our water quality. 
and our habitat quality. If you have dragonflies or damselflies, that's a good thing. Consider yourself lucky and work to preserve that habitat and the quality of that habitat. Dragons and damsels are impacted by pesticides. That includes mosquito controls that are applied to private residences, as well as statewide spraying. Um, so that's a that's a balancing act with public health. So you have to keep in, keep that in mind as well. Development is reducing habitat. Um, so think about how we can safely satisfy our housing, et cetera, needs with keeping these insects, insect populations healthy. And climate change is an overall stressor that's changing water temperatures, um, and impacting air quality, for example, with the, the wildfires that we're experiencing. So that is also impacting these animals. And I wanted to leave you, as you're formulating your questions uh, for the last five minutes or so, we can go a little over, with some of the resources that I appreciate and, and want to pass on. So respective and pertaining to dragonflies and damselflies, there is a great book, the blue one in the middle, a Field Guide to Dragonflies and Damselflies of Massachusetts, and it will also apply to other New England areas. Um, there is Mass Audubon puts out a nice little uh, laminate brochure that has a snapshot picture of many of our common dragonflies and damselflies. And then there is this book, if you are interested in simply uh, damselflies, Damselflies of the Northeast by Ed Lamb is a great resource. Dragonflies and damselflies are featured in some of these other insect, general insect guides, the Peterson Field Guide to Insects, Insects of New England and New York by Tom Murray, and Tracks and Sign of Insects. There is also iNaturalist for taking pictures and identifying and adding to the citizen science biodiversity database. Um, if you can get them to hold still, that's a challenge. Bugguide.net and of course, massaudubon.org are other di digital resources that will help you tune in to dragons and damsels. And then look at everything that we did today. Um, we covered what dragonflies and damselflies are, a little bit of, about the roadmap to the bodies of these insects, some culture, how they travel between generations and through the world, how you tell them apart, a dragonfly versus from a damselfly, and then finishing up with the conservation points. So with that, Robert, I'm gonna turn it over. I'm gonna say thank you very much for your kind attention. And Robert, I'm gonna turn it over to you to facilitate questions. Let me know if you'd like me to keep the slides up or not. Uh, keep the slides up for now, Martha. The, the less they see of me, the better, I think. So <laughs> let's give Martha a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful job. And uh, folks, let's take about 10 minutes or so of questions. Uh, Martha, I'm gonna read the questions as they came in uh, chronologically. Uh, in a couple of instances, you may have already answered the questions, but if that's the case, you can maybe expand a bit. Uh, so Francis asks, how long do dragonflies live in the water for? And the answer, that's a great question. And the answer is it depends on the species. So the majority of them in New England will live from the time their eggs are laid in, let's say, June to August. Um, and then they will emerge the following April or June. So from egg through nymph, we are talking at least nine months. Uh, and in Judith, some cases, that'll, that up to five years. Five years. Judith asks, are these photos colorized or are they natural? They are not colorized in any way. Yeah. Uh, Stephen asks, is the brain of the dragonfly considered relatively big in order to process all the visual information and control all the wing movements, or is the atomic nervous system controlling much of the process instead of the brain? That is a wonderful, amazing question. Um, I don't have a depth of knowledge on that, but I will also say that butterflies also have these large compound eyes and operate their wings independently. And the brain of a butterfly is tiny. 
I'm going to guess that the autonomic nervous system plays some small role, but that the drain, brain of a, of a dragonfly is going to be highly efficient and there's a lot packed in there, but I'm afraid I don't consider myself an authority to comment on the size. All right, an anonymous attendee asks, where do dragonflies go during the winter? They are in the water. Um, in many, most of our species in New England are in the water as nymphs or as eggs waiting to hatch. Some of them, we think that the green darners, for example, um, will migrate down south and then perhaps come back over several generations um, as the... Uh, perhaps as the monarch butterflies do. Deborah asks, has there been any reported cases of dragonflies sewing a human's mouth and or fingers? Because of this information, I have been afraid of dragonflies for my entire 70 years of life. Was it the scientific truth? Oh, Deborah, I'm so sorry. You have been lied to. <laughs> Um, no, there is there there are absolutely no instances. Now, what people here here's why I think that myth has come about is because dragonflies are hunting, and people can be afraid of them because they often think that the dragonflies are coming for you, but people attract mosquitoes, and the dragonflies are most likely chasing the mosquitoes, and so coming towards you. They also can pinch. If you're holding them and you put them on some very tender parts of your body, like the back of your hand, they will pinch you in an effort to get away. And it it's startling, but they're not breaking the skin and they're definitely not sewing you together. Uh, Christine asks, what plants do dragonflies prefer? They, I'm Christine, I'm not sure if you are asking about preferring to perch on or preferring to lay eggs in. Uh, the answer for the perching would be, it doesn't matter. They're looking for, for something to, to land on, to rest on where they can, they can look around or to hide. And for the laying of eggs, they're looking for something that is, I don't, I don't think that they have a preference for particular plants. It's got to be whether it's um, decaying vegetation or perhaps the size of the plant. So I've seen them lay eggs on things like rushes, um, sedges, cattails. Gotcha. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Stephen says, wow, 430 species of darners. Do most bugs have a similar large number of species? How do we distinguish so many different ones like that? There's only one species of humans, correct? I, Stephen, I so appreciate the the awe that that question evinces. Yes, only one species of humans. Um, it again, the answer is it depends. Uh, butterflies. There are many fewer species of butterflies, but than dragonflies in general, but there are many more species of beetles, for example. Um, so it compared to beetles, dragonflies pale in species diversity, but compared to butterflies, they're, uh, they're more impressive. Uh, Robert asks, so what is the thickness of the transparent multiple regions in the dragonfly wings? To that answer, I'm going to say, Robert, you're going to have to find that out yourself. Um, I, they're very thin. They're very, very thin. They're thinner than a sheet of paper. Uh, Richard asks, why do dragonflies sometimes land on our hands? Oh, what a great question. That tells me that you have had that experience, which means that you have been still enough to allow a dragonfly to approach you and feel safe. I'm sure that they're landing on your, your hand because it represents, it's a good perch. And that's, it's probably nothing more than that. They're seeing you as part of the physical environment. Uh, Maureen asks, um, is there a way to attract dragon and damselflies to our yards? 
There absolutely is. Um, thank you for that question. That's that that pertains to our, our bit about conservation. And the way to attract them to your yards is to have something for them to eat and enough physical structure that they feel safe in either hiding out or perching or hunting. So that means um, not using a chemical pest control or chemical insect control. And it doesn't matter what kind of what kind of insects it is, as long as you have food and there are dragonflies around, they will come to you. Uh, Francis says, are there other flying insects in addition to dragonflies that start their lives living in water before metamorphosizing? Great question. And absolutely, yes. To, to name a few, caddisflies, stoneflies, mayflies, um, mosquitoes, beetles. Many, many species of beetles are aquatic or have aquatic nymphal stages. Uh, Beverly asks, what other destructive insects uh, do dragonflies uh, consume? And she's specifically also wondering about uh, aphids. Do they eat aphids? I don't know that they eat aphids. It, perhaps if an aphid were flying, they would, but I've not seen dragonflies walking up and down, chowing down on aphids the way, for example, a ladybug would. Uh, Teresa has an observation, kind of ironic that mosquito spraying is harmful to dragonflies, yet the dragonflies eat the mosquitoes. I could not agree more. Thank you so much for that observation, Teresa. Uh, Sarah asks, how many eggs does one dragonfly or damselfly lay? Um, I believe it is about 100 to 200. I could be wrong. That's my best guess based on what I've seen. Uh, I think we touched on what they do in the winter already. Uh, Justin asks on behalf of a six-year-old viewer, uh, what else do dragonflies eat besides other insects? Well, the, the adult dragonflies, thank you for that question. The adult dragonflies are going to focus on insects, but remember that the nymphs that live in the water can eat tadpoles, so baby frogs, and they can eat small fish as well. Uh, just a comment from an anonymous attendee. While reading a book outside one summer, a dragonfly landed on the corner of my book. It was carrying a dead bug and proceeded to sit and eat the bug. I was horrified and fascinated at the same time. Thank you so much for sharing. That was awesome. <laughs> and Cynthia also uh, is uh, perpetuating uh, that myth. Uh, she uh, writes, uh, I, too, as a child, we feared dragonflies because we were afraid they would sew our mouths shut. We called dragonflies needles. Mm -hmm. uh, an anonymous attendee asks, how, uh, how does the differences in eyes impact their vision? By difference in eyes, if you, if you are referring to the two different kinds of eyes, the simple eyes or the compound eyes. Um, the simple eyes have the ability to see light and dark, and so shadows. And then the compound eyes can actually produce images of, um, of whatever the, the dragonfly is seeing in many different angles because those some of those compound eyes are located at the top of the eye, some of them are located at the bottom of the eye, some of them are located facing straight out. So that means that the dragonfly can see up and down and straight out and to the sides all at the same time. Uh, Christine, so by the way, folks, we're gonna wrap up on the next uh, few minutes. Uh, last call for questions or comments. Obviously not gonna get to them all, but I'm gonna do my best here uh, with the time remaining. Um, Sarah asks, what are the chief predators of dragonflies and damselflies? I assume birds, frogs, and other insects. Uh, I sometimes see them caught in spider webs. Absolutely. Um, I think you've, I think you've named them all. I don't, 
I think cats will probably prey on dragonflies if they can catch them. Uh, but I don't think they're, they're major food sources or, or major predators. So the primary predators are going to be other dragonflies uh, as, well as, as well as birds. And then because the dragonflies are flying so close to the water at times, it will be, they will be easy pickings for frogs as well. Uh, Christine just wants clarification. Uh, what type uh, did you say was called sewing needle? Darners. Those are the darners. Darners, yeah. Uh, Robert, a uh, different Robert, two different Roberts, multiple Roberts on the call. Uh, this Robert asks, are the wings repairable or would that be uh, permanent damage if they if they hurt their wings? They they cannot self repair. It's it's permanent, and that's one reason why the adults tend not to last as long as the nymphs. Um, and it's one reason why you may find dragonflies with tattered wings, for example. One of uh, one of the interesting things you can you can look for is if you go, especially in the early morning, and you walk along a pond or a stream, you may find wings and only wings that belong to damsels and, and dragonflies uh, on, on the trail. And that indicates that something has eaten that insect and then taken the wings off, consumed the body. An anonymous attendee asks, does having a body of water nearby, like a pond or puddles, attract uh, dragonflies more than a property that, that does not have any uh, bodies of water near it? I, absolutely, absolutely, because that allows them the opportunity to uh, to reproduce, to mate. And so they'll see that as a different kind of habitat that they can take advantage of. And I'm going to mispronounce this word, but Nancy asks, I've been told that the vertical posture of a dragonfly's abdomen is called obble skiing, uh, and that uh, this occurs on a hot day to reduce the insect's exposure to the sun. Is this behavior unique to dragonflies or do other insects exhibit this as well? So it's obelisking. And that refers to the root of that is an obelisk, which is that tall, you know, pyramidal uh, structure. Um, and it is, it is absolutely, that's a great, a great question. It is absolutely, um, a response to temperature, and there are other insects that will that will do that, or raise themselves up off of hot surfaces, for example. So if their legs are long, they'll extend their legs and push themselves up over hot surfaces. Uh, many insects, because they are cold blooded, take advantage of having the ability to to put their body in different postures to either expose themselves to additional solar radiation, so heat, or to reduce that by seeking, um, either seeking shade or by moving their body in a certain, uh, certain position. All right, so Martha, let me take two minutes and give you your flowers here. I wanna say some uh, comments, some relay some nice comments to you. Uh, Robert says, really wonderful presentation, thank you. Uh, Christine says, amazing presentation. Frank says, bravo, great presentation. Uh, he is also dragonfly and dams, uh, dam, dams fly uh, enthusiasts. Uh, he appreciates uh, all the scientific terms. Um, they're really amazing uh, insects. Uh, let's see, fabulous talk, very informative. Uh, Francis says, thank you, dragonfly. Do you still go by dragonfly? That's still a nickname of yours? It, it is, okay. yep, when I need it. Uh, uh, Francis says, very educational, learned a lot. Jean says, you find the most, in oh, that was, I guess that was towards me. Okay, never mind that. Anne says, I thank you so much, Martha. You presented a lot of information in a very clear way. Elaine also thanks you. Teresa says, wow, fabulous presentation. Sally says, fascinating and beautiful. Thanks for a wonderful program. Maureen says, amazing, you have motivated me to take a walk to a nearby pond. Uh, EE -E says, thank you, this was a great topic. All right, so Martha, we're gonna wrap it there. Folks, let's give Martha one big virtual, one more big virtual round of applause for a great job. 
Uh, look for an email from me tomorrow, folks, with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming virtual programs that might be of interest. I'm not going to have the Mass Audubon programs for the fall book by tomorrow, but once I do, uh, likely next week, uh, I'll shoot those to you all as well. Uh, Martha, any last words before we wrap it up? Just again, thank you for listening. Thank you for being so enthusiastic and for the great questions. And I really, truly hope that this has inspired you to have a deeper appreciation for the dragonflies and damselflies and what we see out there. All right. I, th I, think, I think mission accomplished, Martha. You did a wonderful job. And thank you for uh, staying late and answering about 25 questions. Uh, so thank you all so, so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again. Bye-bye.